In this episode of Kerbal Gets Real Redux, we are going to be exploring the pinnacle of rocket engineering by using the most cutting edge technology available to us. With that, we are going to make the largest rocket the Earth Aeronautics and Space Agency has ever seen. One that over the course of this episode will be sending probes to both Mars and Venus. And not only that, but also achieving orbit around those planets. And with a few surprises thrown in for good measure. Aside from that, we will be seeing lunar landings as well as the last garrison. We're going to kick this episode straight off with a launch on the 20th of February 1962. It's going to be Spark 12, which once again is going to be an attempt to land on the moon. Now, I haven't included a space center section at the beginning of this episode because quite frankly, nothing happened in January and February. The only thing that I picked up that I won't show was unlocking a new avionics technology. Really thrilling stuff, but what is thrilling is going to the moon again and hopefully successfully landing on its surface. I think for the fourth time, I have been sending a lot of these probes and obviously I do have contracts to complete every time that I send one of these over. I wouldn't just be doing this for fun, although I would get science if I were just to land these in different biomes, which is exactly what I am going to be trying to do every time I do land on the moon. That gives me the most science. What I am doing right now is plotting over my maneuver to the moon. And one thing that I have done here that I have never tried before was changing my reference frame in Principia to the lunar surface. And this means that when you're plotting it out, it tells you exactly where you are going to land. It takes into account the moon's rotation, whereas other plotting frames that I've used before this don't do that. And I picked this crater that we are heading towards whilst I was still at Earth, and lo and behold, the trajectory actually takes me directly to this crater, which was something I did not know about Principia, and it is going to be proving very, very useful for future missions. Say, if I want to land somewhere exactly, I know exactly where I am going to be landing way before I even get there. If I had, say, an unguided Mars mission or something like that, it could be really useful for that. But the hydrogen engine on the base of this lander has fired up. And I did say that I wanted to land somewhere near this crater. I wasn't fully expecting to land inside it. That was not ideal. So I thought, you know what? I've landed all of these personally. Let's see if Mechjeb can do it for us. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work as was planned, and I think that's because I left auto warp on, and it warped a little bit and then didn't give itself enough time to fully slow down. It was still going relatively slow when we hit the surface, so nothing really broke, except the solar panels, which does mean that probe is going to die. That was less than ideal, but we will still gain quite a considerable amount of science from that mission due to the fact that it is going to have battery life for a few days yet. But now what we're going to do is actually design the thing that this whole episode is based on, the pinnacle of rocket engineering. And if this looks a little bit weird to you, if, if this screams uncanny valley, that's because I'm actually building this in reverse. So I built the rocket and then I took it all apart and I reversed the footage in editing because it means the camera doesn't move all over the place and I can talk about the rocket a little bit better whilst I'm watching this. So the top of the rocket is going to have the Pegasus stage that I mentioned in the last episode. That is going to be powered by one RL10. It's a very efficient Hydrolox engine. It's absolutely fantastic for getting places once you are in vacuum. And you can use it in the atmosphere as well, as long as you are high up enough, which is exactly what the stage that I have just been working on is going to be. Although the first stage of this rocket means that most of the time, I will actually be in space by the time I fire up those four RL-10s. The RL-10s that I have on there are just going to be the basic first one for the moment. The reason why is because I haven't actually unlocked any further Hydrolox technology. I just have the first one, and that is quite an unreliable engine. We've had a failure of that already, and chances are it probably will fail again. As soon as I unlock better tech for that, it will get a lot better. But we have worked on the first stage of the rocket now, and it is not really a first stage as such. It's more stage and a half. It does follow the Atlas design principle in where we have four LR-89, so it's quite big, and four LR-105s. Unlike the Atlas though, I'm not going to decouple the LR-89s. I'm, I'm gonna keep them on the bottom because I couldn't really think of a way to make them decouple with those solid rocket boosters on the side. We have got four Algols. But I did a bit of detailing on the rocket and I think it looks pretty nice now. And now comes 
putting together the quickest modular launch pad because I, <laughs> I was just taking it apart. This, this honestly, to me, looks the weirdest, although bringing out fully formed procedural parts as well, there's just something a bit strange about that, but there we go. We can see in Chronal Vessel Viewer, the rocket is completed, and this is able to take a about 13 tons to low Earth orbit on a good day, about 12 and a half for the most part. It does cost me nearly 200,000 funds at all though, which is a big, big, big drain of money. But oh well, and I also need to spend another 65,000 to unlock every single part on here. It's a very costly rocket and I am going to be making a lot of use out of this. This is not only going to be sending a lot of probes interplanetary, but we also may be doing crude lunar operations with this in the very far future. But that's going to be a few episodes away, yeah. A few other things that I want to say about the Pinnacle before we get onto the next launch is I am still using the LR-105s and the LR-89s, which is the engine that I've been using on the Odyssey and the Thunderbolt. I have been using those engines extensively, and the reason for that is, well, it's just costly unlocking new engines. That already cost me 200,000 research credits to unlock. If I would have picked up a new style of engine, that would have cost way more, and I'm still using integral tanks to basically afford avoid spending a huge amount on tooling up the same diameter balloon tanks. Balloon tanks would be a lot better because their dry mass is very reasonable, but Integral aren't that far off and they are a lot cheaper to design. And this is one thing I've really struggled with with PLC compared to Legacy RP1. I find myself constantly running out of money. I'm having to fire researchers and I would be lying if I said I wasn't concerned about how much it is going to cost to design and tool a lunar landing rocket. Anyway, in this space center section, we upgraded the tracking station, unlocked a whole load of new tech, and built Pinnacle, which is now ready to be launched on the 15th of June 1962. This is going to be Shackleton 3, and this is going to be an attempt at orbiting Venus. Now, the launch doesn't go quite as I would have liked it to, because something invisible is stopping the rocket taking off from the pad, and I believe this is the crane on top. Even though there is nothing visible there, I have basically removed it, it still counts as having a collider. This is something that I do change in future launches because I don't really want my rocket smacking into some unforeseen force, un un in invisible, invisible force at the top of the launch tower because that can cause accidents. And when I was flying this in simulations, it did cause accidents. And there were times when the solar panels broke off, the antenna broke, but luckily that didn't happen this time. One of the RL-10s on the upper stage does unfortunately suffer a thrust loss failure halfway through its burn, but I'm still more than capable of getting this into orbit. And with the Pegasus stage and the payload on top, I have 4,300 meters per second of Delta V to get me over to Venus, which is more than enough. So the maiden flight of Pinnacle was a resounding success and we were able to get Shackleton 3 up to low Earth orbit where now I am currently working on my way over to Venus. Now the Pinnacle is a little akin to the Saturn 1 in this save, whereas the Saturn 1 had six RL-10 engines on its second stage, we only have four. So unfortunately we can't lift quite as much and the first stage is also slightly weaker as well using four LR-105s and four LR-89s compared to the eight H1s that the Saturn 1 and then the Saturn 1B did. Another thing that I have taken from the Saturn 1 for this design as well is using smaller tanks, using several smaller tanks to make one larger tank. And the reason why I've done that is just to save money on tooling. Because I already have one meter diameter tanks tooled, it cost me a lot less to place one of those in the center of the Pegasus stage surrounded by an additional six than it would have done to create a two and a half meter diameter tank, which is the diameter of the Pegasus stage. And this is very similar to the Saturn 1's first stage. In order to save money in real life, rather than developing a much larger tank, they actually used eight redstone tanks around a Jupiter core to prevent them from having to make new infrastructure to build the whopping great big tank that would be at the bottom of the Saturn 1. And yeah, I've basically stolen that idea and used it for Pinnacle. With the burn to Venus completed, I was not quite happy with where my trajectory was taking me, but fortunately the RL-10 has multiple ignitions, so a quick 
correction burn is more than enough to put me on a much closer trajectory. Now, because this is not going to be a flyby, no, we are planning on orbiting Venus with this mission, I am going to get it as close as I possibly can and then work out exactly where my final orbit is going to be when I arrive at Venus. I do have three and a half thousand meters per second of Delta V in the capture stage, which once again should be more than enough to put me in a very nice Venus orbit. We're going to have to wait a while for that though, because it's just going to take time. These interplanetary missions do unfortunately have a bit of distance to travel, but fortunately Venus isn't very far, so we are going to see the outcome of that mission before the end of this episode. Now once again I'm realising that I'm really running out of money quite quickly, so I did try and fiddle around with my construction and my engineers and my researchers a little bit to try and get me into the black, because I seem to be running in the red constantly. What I have done here, though, is work on Shackleton 4, which I mentioned there may be a few surprises with the pinnacle over this episode, and Shackleton 4 is going to be a Mars orbiter, but it's not just going to be a Mars orbiter, no. It has a secret component, and that secret component is a Mars lander. We are going to attempt to try and land on the surface of Mars the first time we orbit it. But here we go! Shackleton 4 is already on the 15th of October 1962. There weren't an awful lot of launches over the course of this episode, and we have only had three launches so far up until October. It feels like I am breezing through this episode, but that's because the pinnacle is so much bigger than anything that has come before, and unfortunately, it takes a lot longer, and I have now got 1,000 research, and <laughs> the, the, the fairing didn't want to uh, separate there, which ooh, could have been disastrous, but luckily I flipped the rocket round and it fell off. But anyway, yes, I digress, I was talking about my engineers. I do have 1,000 engineers. And pretty much all of them were working on this rocket, and even then, it still takes an incredibly long time to build one of these. It's just so much bigger than the Odyssey. And once again, I'm going to come back to the point of my lunar landing rocket. I'm concerned how long that's going to take me and how many engineers I am going to need in order to land on the moon with crew. But once again, Pinnacle, I almost said Odyssey then because I've been talking about it, was more than capable of sending Shackleton 4 up to orbit. And I very briefly then turned the thrust limiter down on those separation motors because you don't do that and you're using Principia, Principia thinks that they are going to be providing thrust. And this is very bad for plotting out manoeuvres with Principia because it thinks that you've got way more thrust than you do, so it tells you to start your burn early and then you end up missing Mars by several hundred thousands of millions of kilometres. But that is not going to be the case today because we have almost finished our burn to Mars and we are incredibly close. Our flyby is going to take us only two million kilometres away. And that means it's time to let Shackleton fall free of its trans-Mars injection stage, turn on all of the science, and leave this for quite a while. I'm going to make a deep space manoeuvre to fine-tune my encounter with Mars, but that's not going to be for a few hundred days yet. Mars does take a very long time to get to, but I do have a bit of science, and I've finally picked up lunar orbiter capsules, because I'm not at the stage of doing a moon landing yet, but I've got to be thinking about that constantly. I really need to be striving and working towards that. Now, we approach December, and I realise that I have over 200 signs, and the reason why that happens is because my tracking station that I built the upgrade for earlier on upgraded. And you may remember Shackleton 2 from the last episode, which ran out of communication when it flew by Mars. Fortunately, that actually communicated back with Earth once I upgraded the tracking station, and that meant that I got all of that science then, and I went and bought a lot of tech. But now we are flying the last garrison, and it's the last one of at least the Mercury capsules. I'm still going to stick with the garrison name when I move on to Gemini, because basically the garrison series of missions 
are going to be my missions. Well, at least around low Earth orbit. Once I move on to lunar operations, I'm going to change the name up ever so slightly because Garrison is just, it's just, it's just for Earth. Everyone knows it's for Earth. The moon needs something more important. But George Edwards is on this flight. We've seen a couple of these in the last episode, and well, more than a couple because <laughs> I did some autonomous ones as well. And she was able to fulfill the contract that was assigned to her, and we brought her safely back down. And that means I can come into the administration building and finish the first crewed orbit and pick up advanced crewed orbit which is going to pay me a lot more. And with that, I'm actually able to finally put the construction of the astronaut complex up quite a bit. I had this very low because I just, I was running out of money. I, I couldn't afford to build it with the programs that I had. And then that finally leaves us with the LPO. Once again, launched on an Odyssey on the 11th of December, 1962. LPO stands for, inventively, the Lunar Polar Orbiter, because we're going to be going to the moon and we're going to be orbiting in a polar direction, or inclination even, because I have a contract to map the moon. And unfortunately, we are not going to be seeing that today because the X405 stage of the Odyssey decided it was not going to work today. It, 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 it just said, no, I don't want to send LPO to the moon. We do manage to get it to orbit though, because the TLI stage is more than enough to actually bring this into an orbit. But unfortunately, because we've used the TLI stage to achieve orbit, well, we're not going to be getting to the moon. A little bit sad, but oh well, we can now turn our attention to Shackleton 3, where on the 19th of December, it has finally arrived at Venus. I love Venus flybys, or even anything to do with Venus, because it takes less than a year to get there. It's obviously the closest planet to the Earth, not, not always, but it is generally, well actually no, the closest planet to the Earth most of the time is Mercury, but that's because Mercury is in the centre of the solar system. What I really should say is Venus is the closest planet to Earth at its closest point. When Venus and Earth are closest together, there is nothing closer than them. They're inseparable, basically. But we have fired up the engine on the orbiter stage of this Venus mission, and it fires up successfully, and I'm able to get a lovely Venus orbit. And we're going to keep this here, Pretty much indefinitely. Well, we would if the game didn't crash every time I tried to decouple this. I did mention in the last episode that I was suffering from the same kind of bugs that I encountered on my first lunar lander when I arrived at Venus. And this may be something to do with the fact that I updated RSS Reborn around this time and suddenly Earth is no longer Earth. It is Kerbin, which is why my antenna when I reopened the game after the crash was no longer working, because it was trying to point at Earth, and Earth no longer existed. The update to RSS Reborn that caused this was basically to remove an argument called CB name later, and RSS RP1 pretty much depends on it. And I went ahead and jumped the gun and got the update, and I think this may be very problematic, not just for this mission. I was able to overcome the lack of communications here by telling it to point at Kerbin rather than Earth, but there are some other things that this has damaged in my save as well, including the career thinking that I have not yet passed the Kármán line or launched my first scientific satellite. Both I have done, and if you watch this series you would have seen that I have done those, but it has really messed up the contracts. Don't worry if you do want to get RSS Reborn now though, because that has since been patched out and there is now a fix to that, so this is no longer a problem. This is just something that happened to me when this update went live. And I will say when this update happened, there was a big warning saying people that play RP1 don't update to this. Did I listen? Of course I didn't. And now I may have royally screwed up my save. But yeah, it does mean that I'm going to have to take a look into my save file and see if I can fix some of the things that have gone wrong. A big thanks to Casey, CDR San, Opus, Redstone Wizard, Shadow Dev, Y Mandarin, Chris Morrison, Darth Malakor, Mr. Blue Star, Rail Cowgirl, Ryan Miller, and the rest of my patrons and members for their continued support. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.